Hey there, my name's Jesse, and you're listening to the Deep Lore Boys podcast, where Jackson, Matthew, and I delve into the random, rare, and usually ridiculous pieces of human history. Immediately started cutting down the tree while standing on the roof of the truck. Guys, you you have no idea. I got hit with a cab a couple weekends ago. A whole paragraph is dedicated to him getting roasted by somebody else. Like, <laughs> just... Michael Malloy was an Irishman who lived back in the 1930s. And during the 1930s, there was this fun thing you could do where you could take out a life insurance policy on someone and then kill them. And you would get the money as long as you got away with the murder. Dude, life hack. like is that <laughs> Literally a life hack. I was thinking as you said that that sounds like a really evil thing to do. And then I'm looking up this guy's mugshot. And dude, he is a scary looking person. Well, here's the thing, Jackson. Michael Malloy, he is a scary person, but not because he killed somebody. It's because he could not be killed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bro's immortal. So, picture Michael Malloy, 1933. He is unemployed, homeless, alcoholic. He has a couple friends. And these friends get together and they're like, hey, we can make a lot of money by killing somebody if we all take out a life insurance policy on them. We don't really like Michael Malloy very much, and he'd be really easy to kill. Wait a second. I feel like these friends were not really good friends. They were not. They were not good. Friends. Yeah, Julius <laughs> Caesar had better friends than this guy. So one of them he owns a speakeasy and gives Michael Malloy an unlimited tab. And they're like, he'll just drink himself to death. He's an alcoholic. This will be easy. He's Irish. Uh, it turns out that Irish blood was not to be trifled with because Michael Malloy, he would drink all day, go home at night, come back the next morning, drink all day, go home, come back. Same thing over right. and over. So, so eventually they're like, ah, oh, this isn't working. Let's spike his liquor with antifreeze. Oh, Ooh. And he just, one after the other, no problem. Uh, came back the next day, totally fine. Holy crap. So they're like, all right, antifreeze didn't work. I heard that if you eat oysters and drink alcohol, that's supposed to kill you. So, so they fed him a bunch of oysters. Dude, they fed him raw oysters sh soaked in wood alcohol. <laughs> Dude, that is not that is not a joke. And that was pure methanol, by the way. Okay, so this is no, this is after they replaced antifreeze with turpentine, and then with horse liniment, uh, and then <laughs> and rat finally, poison. Rat poison, yeah. Uh, and none of these worked. Uh, so they were like, "Well, you know what? Fine, give him raw oysters soaked in the wood alcohol." That didn't work, and then they gave him a sandwich of rotten, spoiled sardines mixed in with poison and carpet tax. Dude, uh, these people, these are the worst friends ever. And this they were doing this day after day. They spent so much money on trying to kill this guy that, like, there was no way this was worth it in the end. Because Oh, like, it got worse. It got so much worse from here. Then, yeah, so they concluded that <laughs> Nothing he ingested could kill him quickly enough before the insurance ran out. Like, this dude's pooping carpet tax. Uh, they decided they would freeze him to death. So on a really cold night, uh, he drank until passing out. They carried him to a park, dumped him in the snow, and dumped five gallons of water on him. And then the police found him in the park and were like, hey, he's freezing to death. <laughs> and they brought him back to the station. and or No, they brought him to a homeless shelter. And got him clothes and warmed him up. You're at the bar the next morning and you're talking like, hey, I think I think we finally got him. Malloy's not here. And like, yeah, I think I think he must be dead. We'll just have to wait for the police report. And then at noon, Michael Malloy just walks back in, sandals. He's got an old like sweater on and a beanie. Doesn't care. Like, he just sits down. Crazy next story, you. guys. <sighs> at this point they were fed up. So they tried to run him over with a taxi. And um <laughs> They actually ended up hitting him at 45 miles an hour, which that that is no joke. And those old cars were sturdy, though, too. Yeah, um, that is 72 kilometers an hour for our literally everybody else who's not American. And at this time, um, he was 60 years old. So he ended up in the hospital for three weeks with broken bones. And everyone thought that he was dead. And they couldn't collect the policy on him, I guess, because like they didn't know. Because he wasn't dead. I guess he wasn't really dead. Lo and behold, a couple weeks later. 
He's still back Old at Mike this bar. Swaggers back in, and he has no idea that it's these guys. Like, he doesn't know that they dumped him in the snow. He doesn't know they hit him with the car. He's just coming back in and being like, guys, you you have no idea. I got hit with a cab a couple weekends ago. Craziest thing. These are the, like, truthfully the worst friends. But then, finally, they had enough. Um, They were done messing around. I don't know why they didn't just you know, make use of a firearm or a knife or something at this point. Maybe the life insurance policy barred murder. Like if your client is shot in the chest, you can't collect yeah, as maybe. much money. So maybe they were trying to, or, or they were just squeamish and they were like, well, we can't just shoot him. Let's hit him with a cab. <laughs> like it's, uh, Let's yeah, I don't think they were really squeamish. Like they're coming up with some monstrous ideas. Um, but then they decided to basically put a hose in his mouth uh, that was hooked up to a coal gas jet, which is basically just, you know, coal gas. It's just an extremely flammable substance. And then, uh, you know, that killed him. I guess filled him with coal gas. They just like suffocated him. Uh, so he died yeah. within an hour. And then as they take in his body, they were like, hmm, this doesn't really work because everyone had already heard the stories about Mike Malloy and how like he was Mike the Durable yeah. and how he was really like, like famous for not being killed. For not dying. So at this point, at this point, they were like, why did three people turn in this body like that doesn't that doesn't yeah, make why sense. did they all take out a life insurance on him and then all of a sudden he got hit with a cab left out in the freezing cold you know what happened yeah like uh some so yeah they before, exhumed yeah. his body and very quickly realized oh this guy was killed by gas not pneumonia let's start looking into his friends and uh lo and behold yeah um so they put all of his friends, as well as the doctor uh, who examined the body on trial uh, for homicide, the doctor is like an accessory after the fact is the actual term. Basically, he got the kill assist. Uh, so <laughs> he uh, in, in was, other words, yeah. So he was convicted with a misdemeanor and failing to report a suspicious death to the police and to a medical examiner, which. Uh, yeah. The source that I read said that they actually, the doctor was like being paid by them. And so they were like, hey, uh, we'll give you 50 bucks if you keep this hush hush. And he was like, 50 bucks? This is the 30s. Dude, that's he... awesome. <laughs> One of the guys named Green, I don't know his first name, went to prison. And the other four, including, you know, Marino and Pasqua, who they have here on the wiki, Marino's the creepy guy, uh, were all put in the electric chair and died. Yeah, so. which I should specify, these guys had actually done this before. They had killed, I think, one of the members' girlfriends. Oh. Um, and done the same thing, collected life insurance money. So Michael Malloy was not their first go at this. Mm. And I think that contributed to why they were given the death sentence. From the sounds of this, I think Michael Malloy went to his grave not knowing that his friends were trying to kill him because he passed out. Yeah, I guess he was asleep when they poisoned him, so. So it was honestly not a horrible way to go. He must have, I, I don't know if he suspected anybody was trying to kill him because for the first half of this story, he's just eating these sandwiches and oysters and drinking alcohol. He's having a great time. He's like a kid at a candy store. Yeah. And I don't think like... he realized at all that anybody was trying to kill him. Jesse, you forgot the best fact. Ethanol, they were, like, putting in his drink. The ethanol blocks absorption of um, antifreeze, and it's actually used as an antidote for antifreeze poisoning. Yeah, yeah, actually, ah, I forgot so to mention that. So if you drink a bunch of antifreeze, the cure is literally just alcohol, as much as you can fit in your body. So oh. he, he saved himself by drinking as much as he did. And that's why you should always drink and drink. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> since this has happened there's been like a i guess urban legend and this is stupid guys Ooh. do not do this but um if you eat a raw oyster with hot sauce or drinking alcohol it'll kill the bacteria and you don't have to worry about it being cooked and uh by mm. the way this does not work i thought you were about to say that there was like a a michael malloy tiktok challenge where you have to like slam back alcohol, <laughs> antifreeze, rat poison, get hit by a cab, everything, the whole combo, <laughs> and then we finish it off with uh, I can't remember what it's called. What's the one gas? hour of carbon monoxide? That's poisoning. what it's called. Yeah, I, a I, coal I... gas jet. Yeah, Michael Malloy. It's probably worth mentioning that he was a former firefighter. 
Um, and yeah, oh. about 60 years old at the time of this. Also, firefighting in New York City at that time was no joke. It was rough. It Especially, was Especially, like, so a lot of the Irish did it um, because they were discriminated against, and it was extremely dangerous, and no one else wanted to do it. So they just had all the Irish go and do it. And they remembered the Dublin Whiskey Fire. Never again were they going to let something like that happen. So many of you know about like the Korean War in the the 1950s, after the Korean War had already been over for several years, there was of course the military demarcation line, which is the line between North and South Korea, the no man's land. Well, anyway, so a couple people went into that zone and tried to cut down a tree. These were American soldiers. These were American soldiers and I believe a United Nations soldier. And one of the North Koreans told them that they couldn't chop the tree down because Kim Il-sung, the leader of North Korea, had actually planted that tree, which was like, okay, yeah, right. Dude, really? Sure. They were like, you know what would be really funny is if we cut this tree down. (laughs) So they walked out there with an axe. And unfortunately, this this incident is known by the... uh, the initial trimming. The initial trimming. <laughs> that's what? like the incident that said it The off. initial trimming. <laughs> so when they tried to go in there to do the initial trimming of this tree to um to prune it, <laughs> um, they apparently were met with a man that the United Nations Command had nicknamed Lieutenant Bulldog because he had had a history of confrontations with them and was apparently just a jerk in every single one of them. Boss hmm. fight. Um, and he started yelling at them, saying that the tree couldn't be pruned and that they couldn't do this. The captain here, Captain Boniface, said that they could continue and just turned his back on the North Koreans. Holy crap. So it was just like, <laughs> he just... I ain't reading that essay. Cut down that tree. And this tree wasn't even like in their land. It was in no man's land. Within minutes, according to Wikipedia, a guard truck crossed the bridge and approximately 20 more North Korean guards disembarked carrying crowbars and clubs he demanded that the pruning cease um <laughs> this is cease this is all out the dumbest thing to ever lose it over dude kim il sung planted that tree jackson yeah okay, okay. and that, they're cutting I, it down sure all right dude wait hold on then boniface was killed yes they beat yeah, him yeah, to yeah. death what? So the um, they got the, him. They killed yeah, him. So the North Koreans. No, Lieutenant Bulldog was so mad that he screamed to kill them at all of his like men, and they killed. Yeah, they killed him. Yep. Ah, oh, Boniface was knocked what? to the ground and bludgeoned to death by at least five North Koreans. All because he cut down a tree. Well, no, he was going to cut down the yeah, tree. Yeah, he didn't even cut the tree down. And now this is when you hear the eagle soaring overhead and fortunate son blasting. (laughs) The U.S. did not think that this was cool. (laughs) This was a stupid thing for um, the North Koreans to lose it over. Especially to kill someone. Hold on, hold on, wait, wait. Can I please read the North Korean media report that they stated? uh, Oh, I would love to. Matthew reading propaganda is like how I fall asleep at night. Around 10.45 a.m. today, the American imperialist aggressors sent in 14 hoodlums with axes into the joint security area to cut down the trees on their own accord, although such a work should be mutually consented beforehand. Four persons from our side went to the spot to warn them not to continue the work without our consent. Against our persuasion, they attacked our guards en masse and committed a serious provocative act of beating our men, wielding no. murderous weapons depending on the fact that they outnumbered us. Our guards could not but resort to self-defense measures under the circumstances of this re- reckless provocation. It was four of uh, so, us North Koreans against 20 American savages, yes, but we managed to fight them off. We fought them off and, and oh, they, they we didn't saved cut the down a single tree. So in response to the incident, the United States retaliated. Yeah, they were not, they did not have it. And so enter Paul Bunyan. And by <laughs> Paul Bunyan, I mean two eight-man teams of chainsaw-wielding military engineers along with two 30-man security platoons uh, uh, from <laughs> the U.S. government. <laughs> who all so, showed up 
just to cut down this tree, just to avenge these people. <laughs> just to avenge. So they showed up. I, they brought the whole squad. All the boys were here for this one. There was a 64-man task force of the Rock Army 1st Special Forces Brigade, armed with clubs and trained in Taekwondo, supposedly without firearms. Holy crap. Um, there was a lot more than that. They had... They had t- oh, okay. seven Cobra attack helicopters <laughs> circling behind them, as One well as... 20 utility uh, helicopters. Yes, they had a B-52, a B-52 shadow <laughs> fortress that came yeah. from Guam. <laughs> Four <laughs> Phantom 2s. Uh, and a oh South Korean gosh. F-5 and F-86. Now, you would think North Korea would be intimidated by this, but I feel bad for the tree. Like, imagine <laughs> seeing tree. the entire <laughs> execution <laughs> squad roll up. Dude, no like, tree, yeah, no matter point. how powerful, was going to w- live through this. I, I don't care if it was Kim Il-sung who planted yeah, it, tree. Kim Jong-un who planted it. Like, man. This is the ultimate skull emoji moment. So... First Lieutenant Patrick Ono, he left his vehicle once the convoy arrived and immediately started cutting down the tree while standing while standing on the roof of the truck. <laughs> so he wasn't just like, oh, I'm just going like, to so they, they drove up with the convoy. And he, just started, he just starts hacking at it. Um, <laughs> the remainder of the task force dispersed their assigned areas of, around the tree and assumed their roles of guarding the engineers. It ain't me. And North it Korea did not like this I at all. No <laughs> North Korea, according to Wikipedia, quickly responded with about 150 to 200 troops who were armed with machine guns and assault rifles. It's a tree! What is the problem? They really don't like this, dude. Holy crap. The dude, battle they the arrived tree. in buses. They didn't arrive in, like, military vehicles or anything like that. Like, the U.S. is showing up with fighter jets and seven Cobra helicopters and all this stuff, a shadow fortress. Oh. And what they're showing up in is just buses. They show up in school buses. They're not even wearing shoes. Hey, they're <laughs> just... trying. Okay, they're trying. They're, um. they're for the tree. Um, upon seeing their arrival, Lieutenant Colonel Vera relayed a radio communication and the helicopter and Air Force jets became visible over the horizon. So I guess an Air Force base in Japan was also on alert so yeah, they could um, they could provide a dozen C-130s as backup if this like escalated. basically this was just to make sure we are going to cut this tree down and if they try anything, they're dead. It was kind of just I what they're glad. saying. Here. Yeah. And uh then apparently <laughs> so, so, five minutes in to you know them cutting this tree down, they had an intelligence analyst effectively uh, hack into the <laughs> into the North Koreans' radio net. What? Uh, and he was what? listening to what they were saying in response, and uh, it's in you know military speak, so plenty of language. So I guess we can't really say it here. But long story short, uh, <laughs> he just said that they were. T- Terrified. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read this. It says the attempt at intimidation was apparently successful. And according to the intelligence analyst monitoring the North Korean tactical radio net, the accumulation of force blew their effing minds. <laughs> they just, they were, can you just imagine a bunch of North Korean guys on the phone like, D- dude, dude, what? The tree. No. No. So eventually, once, once the North Koreans realized that they were actually chopping this tree down in the buses. <laughs> they set up two machine gun positions and watched in silence <laughs> as the tree was felled in 42 minutes. 42 so, minutes it took them to cut this tree down. And they just watched this like in horror as they were cutting Man. down this tree that was made by that was planted by Kim Il Sung. And you know what? 42 minutes, apparently they estimated that it would take about 45. Uh, so they got it done. <laughs> so like, we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> they left up like a little stump of it. Like they left the stump there as like a reminder for the incident. They uh, deliberately it was... left it standing. Yeah, they left it. So as left, the North Koreans were preoccupied with this, the South Korean troops vandalized two North Korean guard posts. North Korea was too too occupied with this at the moment. Man, this was a massive L for North Korea. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. 
The United Nations Command demanded that the North Koreans punish those involved and make adequate respirations for the families of those injured and killed. Later, on the day of Operation Paul Bunyan, it received a message from Kim Il-sung expressing regret at the incident. So they made him sad. Kim Il-sung the, directly. He, he sends him yeah. an email and is like, I didn't even plant that tree. I am so I sorry. Know. He's like, I, I don't, don't even know what... where this tree came from. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what that guy was on about. Not only did Kim Il-sung ex- express the fact that he regretted that this happened, it was the first time since the ending of the Korean War that the um, North had actually accepted responsibility for violence in the demilitarized zone. Oh, wow. So they literally said, like, you know what? This was us that did this. This did happen. We're sorry. My bad. I mean, it's kind of hard to put it any other way when there's two people dead and they're, you know, both not North Korean. Like, what happened? They tripped. Like, they're not really going to get away with that. If it was Army, it would have been different. But because they were UN workers or one of them was a UN worker, that like, there's no way you can spend that 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 looks good. Kim Il-sung got a press conference together and was like, I didn't want to have to make this video, guys, but... <laughs> He's like, guys, I, <laughs> uh, I think I think this needs to be said. I didn't script this. I'm not going to drone on forever, but um, <laughs> it was actually our fault this yeah, time. Uh, I, guys, he, he has to open it with like his hand on the camera, like turn it on. He's like... Yeah. Like shot right in front of Yeah, he cracks his dog out, and he's like, ah, guys. Uh, <laughs> that being said... Uh, we're gonna uh, have hold a on, giveaway. Hold on a second. Um, he pulls out a ukulele. He's yeah, like, actually, I wrote a song uh, for this. <laughs> How bad can, can I be? <laughs> Dude, no. this honestly. Oh, actually, no, no, never mind. Because this, they, they couldn't have called this Operation Lorax because this is the exact opposite of the. Lorax. I don't know this if like the Lorax had been Andy written Lorax. at this point. Maybe I had. I don't know. But John Bunyan's so much cooler. He's an American hero. The Lorax. What is he, European? Yeah, it's Paul Bunyan, but yeah. Oh, Paul Bunyan. Yeah, whatever, that Paul guy. Bunyan. The guy who cut down the cherry tree and didn't lie about it. That was George Washington did that. Ah, same thing. Oh, man, I so Lieutenant Bulldog, I guess, just decided that Kim Il-sung planted that tree. <laughs> he made it like, up. <sighs> Lieutenant Bulldog, I think, is like the biggest villain in the story. Um, Dude, this guy is up there with like Governor Mendoza on just like humans that just suck you know this is i like that this story is one of tasteful revenge because it's not like they went in their guns blazing and killed yeah they didn't just kill anybody Koreans. they just wanted this tree down and they it was a show of anybody. force and it was a really yeah. good show of force there's not a lot that you can be proud to know your taxpayer dollars are going to but this this is one of them okay this is my one taxpayer of them. dollars are going to stuff like that like no, I Amen. I fully respect that, and uh, rest in peace to Boniface and Barrett there. Um, yeah, R.I.P. There's a lot of times in history where people were killed or done injustice, and unfortunately, it was just like a loose end and stuff. And I feel like this was they made this sure is a really that this was good not up, going yeah. to be a loose end. Yeah, like, they were going to be met with justice, and they were. I would say that like they they rest peacefully now because that tree is gone. Well, boys, we did it. That tree is no more. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I've got a bit here. I've got one that I've been looking forward to. So I'm going to send this to the chat. But you guys don't... As soon as you see the name of this article, like the funny bit will be given away. But there's a lot more to this guy. He's actually really funny. So just don't give it away. Because the reveal, <laughs> the reveal is funny. Earl of Sandwich. You you literally just did what I specifically told you not to do. <laughs> I, oh, I am that evil. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> so John Montagu, he was this British statesman, an earl, and he was in power in the British government, like a little before the Revolutionary War. So they were still you know, kings of the world and whatever. And he sucked. He was like a very incompetent Earl. Uh, Apparently he, he just was not known for being very good at his job, but legend says uh, that he was really into gambling. And so this guy, I mean, he was so into gambling that he did not want to leave once the game was afoot and to sustain himself. He made like bread with meat slapped between it. 
And so no. his friends, his friends no. saw like, wow, this guy has been gambling for like 32 hours and he's eating nothing but this bread and meat looking thing. So he'd go up to the bartender or whoever was there and be like, hey, I want what John Montagu is having. But John Montagu was known by another name. He was the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Dude, he invented it. And that's how he got the name. And that's how he got the sandwich. Apparently a saying was said about him. He inspired the saying. Seldom has any man held so many offices and accomplished so little. <laughs> man, that is a... Dude, dude, he was gambling all the time, dude. Okay, this man accomplished more than I think anybody else that has ever been in office because he literally invented a sandwich. Okay, like... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that was on accident. Still, I mean... Apparently, he was known as quite the gambler, and he was not active in the army, apparently, and remained on the half-pay list, and still kept, like, ranking up, even though he wasn't doing anything in the army. Uh, but he invented the sandwich. Um, so, honestly, at the end of the day... You guys want to know a fact on the Deep Lore Boys? Um, 99% of gamblers, they quit right before they're about to win it all. Thanks, no thanks way. for that, Jackson. <laughs> it's the same thing as like the eighty percent of car crashes happen with sober drivers. Be safe, drive drunk. It's like uh... drive drunk. <laughs> that's okay. right, man. Uh, that's really stupid. Okay. This is the other interesting thing about sandwich that I read before coming here. Oh shoot! Okay. There was a famous exchange between John Montagu and Samuel Foot. Sandwich declared, "Foot." I have often wondered what catastrophe would bring you to your end, but I think that you must either die of the pox or the halter, and the halter <laughs> is uh, being hung. My lord, replied Foot instantaneously, that will depend upon one of two contingencies, whether I embrace your lordship's mistress or your lordship's principles. <laughs> Dude, um, why is it so formal? Shout out to Samuel Foot, dude. <laughs> So literally in uh, Earl of Sandwich's whole Wikipedia article in his thing for personal life, a whole paragraph is dedicated to him getting roasted by somebody else. Like, <laughs> just <laughs> like oh, there was that one time he got, <laughs> he got blasted burned. by Samuel like... Foote. So yeah, John Montagu, uh, he sucked as a politician, but he changed cuisine Across the world, he really, cha he forever. changed the world. I mean, this man is like single-handedly. We can attribute him to, I think, like ninety percent of American food. Fox in the Discord says, "Sandwich, where's the sand? Bad marketing." <laughs> yeah, well, they it. named some islands after him, so Dude, they named some. Yeah, so we almost got it. I ate all the sand, man. I'm hungry, you know what I mean? I'm actually going to be um to to further insult British people here and say that. <laughs> At least he added something to their culture because, <laughs> like, this man did more for the uh, British cuisine than, like, <laughs> everybody else on that island combined. Man. He, he may have not been a good politician or a good general, but he was a good cook. He wasn't even the cook. Well, he was the orderer, dude. He's like, this guy was, like, customer <laughs> service king. Okay. Everyone else was like, beans on toast. And he was like, salted beef on toast. <laughs> and that changed the world. <laughs> and the world was never the same. <laughs> hey again, it's Jesse. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Deep Lore Boys podcast. If you had fun, please share this episode with one of your non-reptilian friends. And we'll see you next time. Until then, I hope your day is nothing short of interesting. Take care. I'm going to go post that one on Twitter.com.